My next, our, our next presenter is uh, Professor Pete Pedroso, retired Navy captain. Um, I met Pete 24 years ago when I first came in. He was one of my instructors over at Naval Justice School, sort of a mentor. 33, almost 34 years in the military, eight years in the Army, 82nd Airborne, and came over to the Navy. Um, was an amazing career, was down in Just Cause, down in Panama, as a Navy Lieutenant, I think manning a checkpoint, some great experiences. Operationally, none finer than Pete from a JAG perspective. Um, been on a carrier, carrier group, things of that nature. Uh, was on the investigating officer for the Black Sea bumping off the Crimea coast back in the 1980s between the Soviet Union and the United States, a freedom of navigation ops. So he knows all about that. Then he went off to do some of the uh, big tours in DC at the Pentagon, our Office of Policy, Law of the Sea was the uh, SGA for the Special Operations SEALs out in uh, Coronado, and ended up his career as the SGA at our Pacific Command. Spends a lot of time talking about Asia Pacific type items. It's great once again to have uh, Professor Pedroso here, so please uh, give him a round of applause as you did. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, well, as you can see, we're going to talk about uh, Asia-Pacific uh, maritime disputes over the next hour or so. Um, that's what I've spent most of my time looking at these days. Um, so without any further ado, we'll, what, what I want to do is, first off, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the law, a basic on Law of the Sea so that you uh, have a working knowledge of that when you do your seminars um, over the next two days. Um, and, but then I'm going to shift and talk uh, specifically about military activities in the exclusive economic zone and how some nations are trying to uh, alter what the law says about uh, the right to engage in military activities in the, uh, in the uh, exclusive economic zone. And then we'll look at some specific uh, issues that have occurred within the last six months in, uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea so that you can see the relevance of, of uh, the law of the sea and, and uh, other uh, uh, international law uh, aspects of how they, how they play out in the uh, in, in, uh, in real world. So you can see the, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which the U.S. is not a party to, but reflects customary international law, so we observe most of its, uh, of its provisions, basically divides the ocean into zones. The closer you are to the land, the more control the coastal state has. Uh, the further out you get, the greater rights the user states have uh, in the various maritime zones. But everybody, uh, all coastal station, nations can draw baselines and all the water that is uh, landward of that baseline is internal waters subject to the exclusive sovereign control of the coastal state. You can't go in the internal waters of another nation without that coastal state's uh, uh, Per, uh, uh, permission. Uh, then they've got a 12 nautical mile territorial sea measured from the baseline and the territorial sea is treated very much the same as sovereign land territory. Uh, the only exception is that uh, ships, not aircraft, ships have a right of innocent passage in the territorial sea of another nation. Uh, aircraft in the airspace above the uh, territorial sea do not have a right of transit without the consent of the coastal state. Then you have an additional 12 mile contiguous zone. This is basically a law enforcement zone uh, where the coastal state can exercise customs, fiscal, immigration, and sanitation uh, laws and enforce those laws out to basically 24 miles uh, into the contiguous zone. For purposes of navigation and overflight, the contiguous zone is treated like the high seas. All nations have a right to transit and operate in the contiguous zone of another nation, so long as they're not violating one of those four laws. Then, all nations can claim a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. Uh, that is a resource zone. Within the exclusive economic zone, the coastal state exercises sovereign rights, not sovereignty like they do in the territorial sea, sovereign rights over all of the resources in the exclusive economic zone. So the fish, the oil and gas, et cetera, all belongs to the coastal state. And if you want to exploit those resources in the exclusive economic zone of another nation, you have to have that nation's consent. In addition, the coastal state exercises environmental jurisdiction in the EEZ 
and they also exercise exclusive jurisdiction over marine scientific research in the EEZ. So if you want to engage in any of those types of activities, you have to have the coastal state's permission before you, uh, you do that. Again, as the contiguous zone, the EEZ, for purposes of navigation and overflight, are treated like the high seas. So you can engage in military activities in the exclusive economic zone just like you can in the high seas areas, so long as you're not unreasonably interfering with the coastal state's resource rights in that zone. So you, know, you can't go in there and uh, conduct a military exercise within 500 meters of one of their offshore oil platforms, because that would be interfering with their resource rights. Uh, so there, there is some due regard that has to be paid to the coastal state's resource rights, but at the same time, the coastal state has to pay due regard for the rights of all users to operate in the exclusive economic zone consistent with international law. Um, and then we have the high seas. High seas are open to all nations. No nation may uh, subject the high seas to its, uh, to its sovereign control, um, and all nations can, can operate in the, in the EEZ, again, with due regard for the rights of other nations in those zones. That gives you a basic overview of, uh, of the law of the sea. A couple other important provisions that you need to uh, um, be aware of uh, in the law of the sea is prior to the 1982 UN Law of the Sea Convention, most international straits, you know, you look, think about Hormuz, Gibraltar, uh, the Straits of Malacca, uh, they all had a high seas corridor because back then the maximum breadth of the territorial sea was only three nautical miles. So that meant that if you wanted to go through the Straits of Hormuz, you just stayed outside of the territorial sea of the coastal state and you could exercise high seas freedoms of navigation and overflight through the strait. But with the extension of the territorial sea from 3 to 12 nautical miles under the Law of the Sea Convention, all of a sudden, 115 international straits were now overlapped by the territorial seas of the littoral coastal nations. What does that mean? Well, remember, territorial sea, if you're a submarine, you can't navigate through the territorial sea of another nation submerged. You have to be on the surface, and you've got to be flying a flag. If you're an aircraft, you can't overfly the territorial sea of another nation. So what did that mean for purposes of international straits? All of a sudden we had a problem that we're not going to be able to get our ships and aircraft or submarines and aircraft into a the Persian Gulf, for example, because you would, have to, you would have to disclose your presence in effect or request permission if you were an aircraft. So the trade-off was this concept of, of uh, creating transit passage rights through international straits. So all these straits that are now overlapped by territorial seas the international community still has a right of access through the international strait in the normal mode of operation. What's the normal mode of operation of a submarine? It's submerged. Normal mode of operation, aircraft. You can fly through without requesting permission. So now we have an absolute right, non-suspendable right in, during peacetime uh, of transit passage through international straits. Um, U.S. position is it applies shoreline to shoreline. Not all nations agree with that. Uh, and the reason we say it applies shoreline to shoreline is not for ship purposes, because you're not going to navigate that close to the coast anyway. But if you might want to have an aircraft fly that within you know, a mile of the coast. And that would be permissible under the transit passage regime, even though you would technically be in the national airspace of that coastal state. But because you have a right of transit passage, you do not have to have the coastal state's permission to, uh, to transit the, that, uh, through that corridor. One thing that the coastal state can do, they can go to the International Maritime Organization and have traffic separation schemes approved for safety of navigation purposes. And most international straits that have a significant amount of traffic in them do have IMO approved traffic separation schemes in the, uh, in the strait. What does that mean for warships? Really, it doesn't mean anything because under the SOLAS Convention, which is the convention that traffic separation schemes are approved under, there's a sovereign immunity exception that warships don't have to comply. They can comply if they want to, but there is no legal obligation for a warship to comply with a traffic separation scheme. But in most cases, they will because of safety of navigation concerns. A similar concept with transit passages, uh, archipelagic sea lanes passage. One other thing that the convention created was the right of an archipelagic nation, and you think of island nations, because an archipelagic nation has to be an island nation, 
Um, and then it has to meet certain tests of requirements of water ratio to land ratio in order for it to qualify as an archipelago. But if it does qualify, and here's an example of Indonesia is obviously an archipelago under the convention, the Philippines, uh, a, lot of, a lot of archipelagos, uh, about 17 or 18 that are recognized around the world. But again, the convention allows the archipelagic nation to draw straight baselines around all the islands. And then all the waters inside the baselines are considered archipelagic waters and they're treated like the territorial sea for purposes of navigation. You cannot navigate, you cannot go uh, overfly the archipelagic waters of an archipelagic nation without their consent because archipelagic waters are the same technically as, as uh, territorial seas. So what the convention did was it created this right of archipelagic sea lanes passage, very similar, the exact same rules apply to transit passages as an archipelagic sea lanes passage. And what it, what it does is that the international community can use all the normal routes used for international navigation through that archipelago in the normal mode of operation. So here you can see the uh, uh, Indonesia has gone, is the only nation that's gone to the IMO and has designated three north-south sea lanes with some associated spurs. But while we were negotiating the, uh, this at the IMO, the US and Australia came in and said, those aren't the only internationally recognized routes through the Indonesian archipelago. There's also some major east-west uh, routes that are available, and the IMO agreed, and what, it, what the bottom line is that even though Indonesia has only designated three archipelagic sea lanes, the right of archipelagic sea lanes passage continues to apply in all the normal routes used for international navigation until such time as Indonesia goes back to the IMO and it does a full designation of all the normal routes. So uh, that's, that's where we are right now with regards to uh, archipelagic sea lanes passage with uh, Indonesia. You can see in the sea lanes, you have a right of archipelagic sea lanes passage, and then you have a right of innocent passage in archipelagic waters. All right, so that's your very quick uh, uh, overview of uh, the law of the sea. Um, the convention has very specific rules in it. Some of them are more open to interpretation than others, and that leads some states to have uh, what we call excessive maritime claims, straight baselines being an example. The uh, normal, the convention says that the normal baseline that a coastal state will use is the low water mark, shown on this large scale chart. However, it does provide in exceptional circumstances where the coastline is deeply indented or there's a fringe of islands along the coast that allows the coastal state to draw straight baselines uh, along the fringing islands or to close off the deep indentations. Think Norway, the fjords off Norway. They can, they can close those off with straight baselines. The problem is that probably 95 percent of the countries that use straight baselines do so Ill illegally under the law of the sea convention because they don't meet that criteria of deeply indented coasts or fringing islands so that's a problem area and the problem is that when you have a straight baseline that's illegal what does that do it pushes all the maritime zones further out doesn't it because all the maritime zones are measured from the baseline so if you've got a country that has an, an excessive straight baseline all of a sudden what something might have been an eez area is now a territorial sea area and that might create a problem uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you want to have access and, and engage in military activities in that area. Restrictions on innocent passage. As I mentioned, uh, all ships, even warships, have a right of innocent passage in territorial sea. But there are nations that say, if you're a warship, you have to have my permission before you can transit in innocent passage through my territorial sea. About 30 or 40 countries uh, that do that out of the 160-some countries that are parties to the, uh, to the convention. Uh, the other restrictions on innocent passage might be nuclear powered ships may require the permission of the coastal state before they, uh, they can transit through the territorial sea and innocent passage. Again, these are illegal requirements, but some states try to uh, enforce them. Another area, security jurisdiction, as I mentioned, the contiguous zone uh, really applies to four laws, customs, fiscal, immigration, and sanitation. Uh, but some states will say we also have security jurisdiction in the, exclusive, in, in the contiguous zone. So you cannot engage in any type of military related activities in our contiguous zone because that violates our, our sovereignty. Again, illegal claim, but we see that in some cases. Uh, the most problematic one uh, for us right now is uh, restrictions on military activities in the EEZ because we're talking about you know, a 200 mile zone off the coast, that's pretty significant. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a minute. Restrictions on transit passage. 
Uh, Iran, for example, says that if you're not a party to the convention, read United States, you don't have a right of transit passage because you're not a party to the convention. Therefore, you don't, you don't have a right of transit passage through the Straits of Hormuz. Um, there are some coastal nations will restrict uh, transit passage for nuclear-powered uh, vessels, for ships carrying hazardous cargo. Uh, that's been a problem in the past. Again, illegal requirements, but some, some uh, nations will do that. Same thing with the restrictions on archipelagic sea lanes passage. Um, and then uh, historic bays, historic waters um, are considered to be internal. If it's a valid claim, a historic bay would be a internal waters, which means you have to have the permission of the coastal state to go into that area. Uh, Peter the Great Bay, for example, the Russians claim that to be internal waters. Uh, in the old days, Libya used to claim the Gulf of Sidra as historic waters. It drew, drew the line of death across the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Gulf of Sidra uh, and re re resulting in a number of uh, incidents with the United States uh, over the years. Um, so those are, that's just an example of how, even though the conventions says one thing, nations will interpret it a different way and apply the, the, the rules uh, that su suits their, their purposes. Now, if you want to find out what excessive claims exist uh, in the world, just go to this website. And Kevin, you hung this on the, uh, they have access to these slides? Uh, yeah, they will have access. Okay. This, this uh, website here is run by the Navy JAG lists every, it's, a, it's the Maritime Claims Reference Manual, and it lists every nation in the world that has a maritime claim, and it lists whether or not the, it, it is an excessive claim in, in the view of the United States, and if it is an excessive claim, it'll also state when we conducted a freedom of navigation assertion or when we file a diplomatic protest against that nation uh, objecting to their, to their maritime claim. So very useful uh, reference when you're actually doing operations. If you're doing operations off a of coast of a nation, you may want to pull the Maritime Claims Reference Manual and figure out well, what, what are, the, what are the, 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 the maritime claims of the neighboring nations. Are we going to somehow run into problems uh, because they may have an excessive claim that uh, may impact our operations. So good, uh, good, good reference point uh, for you to take a look at sometime in the future. All right. As I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit more about the exclusive economic zone because, again, this is also a creature of the convention. The exclusive economic zone did not exist until the convention was finalized in 1982. There had been some fishery zones, the United States being one, had claimed 200-mile fishery zones. Some nations had claimed 200 nautical mile territorial seas, uh, were, which were very excessive. Uh, but the convention um, kind of made a compromise and said, okay, we'll have this exclusive economic zone where the coastal state can exercise resource rights, because that's really what the coastal state was interested in, was having uh, access to the resources in, uh, in the exclusive economic zone. But as I, you can see, about four, almost 40% of the world's oceans is comprised of exclusive economic zones. So if you are one of these countries that claims the right to restrict military activities in the exclusive economic zone, that creates a problem for user states. Um, because you, you can see that, you know, a lot of all of Southeast, uh, of the South China Sea, um, obviously the, uh, the the Mediterranean, the uh, Persian Gulf, you know, etc. They're they're completely overlapped by the 200 mile zones of the various uh, coastal nations. So, if you can, if they can restrict military activities in the EEZ, then that's a problem, particularly for, uh, for a maritime nation like the United States. There you can see the 18 countries that uh, purport to restrict military activities in the EEZ. Uh, you can see it's regionalized by and large. As you can see, uh, the red ones are the Southeast Asia, or the, the Asia Pacific uh, nations that, uh, that purport to regulate military activities in the EEZ. But you can see the other ones are also regionalized with, uh, you know, uh, and then I, what I call the Portugal uh, uh, conspiracy, which is Portugal, Brazil, and uh, Cape Verde, the, the former colonies uh, of, uh, of uh, Portugal, um, also have uh, uh, restrictions on military activities in the, in the EEZ. Now, the restrictions that are imposed by these nations vary from country to country. They're not all the same. Some might prohibit uh, military marine data collection. So if you've if you got a special mission ship that's conducting surveillance in somebody's EEZ, if you're one of these nations, like let's, uh, let's pick on uh, China, for example, they're saying that you're engaged in uh, um, 
marine scientific research. And who has jurisdiction over marine scientific research in the EEZ? It's the coastal state. But collecting intelligence isn't marine scientific research, so they don't have jurisdiction over it. Um, other requirements, uh, prior notice and consent before you go in there to do military activities, they might be environmental restrictions imposed. Um, again, some nations will say that low frequency acoustic uh, um, sonar harms the, uh, uh, the marine mammals in their exclusive economic zone and therefore uh, you can't uh, engage in that type of activity in their EEZ. Problem with that argument is that that's an environmental jurisdiction and under the convention, warships and other sovereign immune vessels do not have to comply with any of the environmental provisions of the convention. There's a complete exemption in the, in the convention that allows us to carve out all the environmental provisions from application to our sovereign immune warships and, and other government uh, owned or operated vessels. Um, and then some national security restrictions. Now, having said that, we, you know, we've got 18 countries that say you, you can't engage in these activities. There have only been three countries that have used force to try to, uh, to uh, enforce their claims um, against uh, the, the U.S. You all, uh, most of you won't remember, but uh, in 68 you had the Pueblo, it was 15, uh, about 16 nautical miles off of an island off of North Korea. It specifically had been sent to the area to collect intelligence overtly, to gauge how the Soviets and how the North Koreans would respond to the presence of that ship there. I think they got a little bit more than they bargained for. Uh, the vessel was attacked by the North Koreans and the crew was held hostage for over a year, or almost a year, uh, until they were finally released. Uh, China, however, has been the, uh, the uh, more notable uh, country that's, that's uh, interfered with military activities in the, uh, in the EEZ. And this is just a sample of the, uh, the uh, the events that have made it into the newspapers. This stuff goes on all the time uh, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, in the Yellow Sea, where the, where the Chinese will uh, harass military vessels and aircraft that are, that are within their EEZ. But these are the ones that actually make the newspapers. Bowditch and the EP3 incident in 2001. Uh, this, is a, this is during a time frame where the administration had just changed over. The Bush administration was coming into power. Um, most political appointees were not yet in place in the, in the Pentagon or at the State Department. I think China took the opportunity to see how the U.S. would respond to, the, to this type of, har of harassment. You remember the EP3 incident was fairly significant because it resulted in a mid-air collision of a U.S. aircraft and a Chinese fighter. Chinese uh, pilot was killed. Uh, the U.S. Air aircraft had to make an emergency landing on Hanan Island and they were held uh, uh, captive there for about two weeks until we negotiated their release um, and, and got them out of there and got the plane out of there about uh, uh, July of that same year, 2001. Fast forward eight years from then, and now Obama's administration's coming in. What happens? You got the victorious and you got the uh, impeccable incidents in, in 2009. The uh, George Washington uh, incident occurred in, uh, um, 2010, and somebody asked a question about the Chonan uh, sinking. This, the uh, wa George Washington uh, was sent uh, to uh, conduct exercises in the Yellow Sea with the uh, uh, Korean Navy following that uh, um, the sinking of the of the South Korean vessel. Um, the Chinese objected, saying that the presence of a carrier that close to the Chinese coast was. Uh, contrary to their national security interests, and therefore the U.S. Uh, S. George Washington should not be allowed to conduct uh, any type of operations in the Yellow Sea, um, because that would be um, um, a, a, a threat to their, to their security. Um, U-2 incident in uh, 2011, uh, intercept of, uh, of the U-2 that was flying through the Taiwan Strait. Now, the Taiwan Strait isn't one of these international straits because it's wide enough across to have a high seas corridor. So, really, anybody can go through the Taiwan Strait outside of 12 miles of the coast of Taiwan and 12 miles off the coast of China because they have this high seas corridor. But again, Chinese intercepted the U-2 uh, in 2011. Uh, not solely a U.S. issue. Uh, we've had Indian ships that have also been uh, harassed by uh, by the PLA Navy uh, in the South China Sea, and then. Uh, in 2013, uh, the impeccable uh, incident, um, and most recently, in December of uh, last year, the Cowpens uh, incident. Uh, Cowpens was conducting surveillance of, the, uh, of China's new aircraft carrier. 
It was in the South China Sea doing uh, um, uh, military exercises. Uh, the, uh, one of the escort ships uh, radioed the cow pens and uh, told them to leave the uh, area. Um, cow pens responded saying, we're not leaving, we have a right to be here. Um, as a result, then the Chinese ship uh, um, maneuvered uh, within uh, 500, 500 uh, meters of the, uh, of the cow pens, came to a full stop, uh, forcing the cow pens to uh, make, uh, take uh, uh, evasive action in order to avoid a collision. Now, the initial response, uh, or I should say the, the, the justification given by the, uh, by the Chinese was that the cow pens had entered um, a 45 kilometer interdefensive layer and that, and that was a trip wire uh, for them and uh, uh, therefore cow pens uh, didn't have any business being there. Uh, however, that ignores the fact that uh, just the previous month uh, there was a PLA frigate that, that had been within 30 kilometers of the George Washington battle group was, that was conducting exercises in the South China Sea. So kind of a you know, do as I say, not as I do type of mentality that uh, sometimes the Chinese uh, will, uh, um, will try to impose on, uh, on other nations. And they also said that the Cowpens was uh, harassing the, uh, um, the uh, carrier and its formation, which is a absolutely a, uh, a ridiculous argument to make. How did we respond? How did they respond? Initially, it was, both sides tried try to downplay uh, the incident. Um, we did deliver a diplomatic protest because it was you know, a, a violation of the collision regula regulations for the P PLA warship to... Uh, uh, to do what it did, uh, so we did file a protest, but um, we pretty much tried to downplay it, saying that you know both sides had acted professionally, uh, etc. Uh, but then a couple days later, we found out that remember I, 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 one of the previous the uh, the Chinese had indicated they had issued a notice to mariners setting out the area where the aircraft carrier was going to be uh, conducting uh, its operations and that other nations should stay out of that area for their own safety. And we do that all the time too. We'll send out a notice to mariners when we're going to do a military exercise on the high seas or in somebody's EEZ that sets out the parameters of the exercise area to make sure that innocent shipping doesn't go in there and, 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 and get, uh, get itself uh, you know, if there, if, particularly if we're using live ammunition, that, that for safety and navigation purposes, we want to make sure that, uh, that the area is clear. Uh, so the Chinese said that they had issued this notice to mariners. Well, they did, but they didn't issue it until the day after the incident had occurred. And when Secretary Hagel found out that it hadn't been issued until the day after, he, his response was a little bit more, uh, um, a, a tougher response than, than we had originally seen, saying that this was uh, unhelpful, irresponsible, uh, it could uh, result in an eventual miscalculation, and that this was a clear violation uh, of uh, the collision regulations. That's one of the only treaties that um, applies to warships. So a warship has to comply with the collision regulations just like a, a merchant vessel does. Uh, so in, in the United States and China are both parties to that treaty. All right, just to summarize, uh, give you an example of how China uses the law to their advantage or to try to make their, try to make their state their position uh, um, more effective in the eyes of the international community. If you look back at 2001, when we had the Bowditch and the EP3 incident, these are the legal arguments that they were making. We were saying that the fact that a U.S. special mission ship or the fact that a surveillance aircraft was in their exclusive economic zone or in the airspace above their exclusive economic zone was a violation of their national security interests. It violated the peaceful purposes provisions of the, of the, of the convention, which basically that they were trying to equate the presence of a surveillance vessel as a threat or use of force against the territorial integrity of China. Um, and then the proximity to the mainland. They, 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 they were arguing that why are we conducting operations 70 miles off the coast? Why can't we do this 250 miles off the coast? Is there a need for us to be within 70 miles of the coast? The platforms that were used to harass were military, either the uh, PLAN or uh, PLA Air Force were the platforms that were used to, uh, to interfere with, uh, with our military activities. After the EP3 incident, 
China got a lot of bad press, uh, the way they handled that incident. As a result, China started rethinking um, some of their legal arguments. They never changed this. They, I mean, even today, in 2014, they're still arguing these, these same things, but they started adding new, new legal arguments to their, uh, to their position. So in 2002, they passed a domestic law, the survey and mapping law, and what that law does is it basically says that any type of data collection in the water column of the Chinese EEZ is marine scientific research and it's subject to their, uh, to their control and, and consent. Again, as I mentioned, surveillance, collecting intelligence is not the same as marine scientific research. It might look like it's the same thing, but the purposes are different. Um, and uh, the coastal state has no jurisdiction over the collection of uh, intelligence in their, in their exclusive economic zone based on an argument that it's marine scientific research. Again, that didn't carry a whole lot of weight in the international community, so beginning in about 2005 when we uh, had one of the, uh, we have a bilateral agreement with the Chinese called the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement where we get together once or twice a year to the extent that we're not, you know, not meeting because you know we've sold weapons to Taiwan or, or something. Um, but at, at the 2005 meeting uh, of the MMCA in uh, um, Shanghai, uh, I was approached by one of the Chinese lawyers and he started making this argument that our use of sonar was harming their marine mammals. Use of sonar was disrupting the fish patterns in the Chinese EEZ and that uh, that was an interference with their resource rights. Um, that was all in conjunction with about the same time that a lawsuit started in the US, in uh, California, where some environmental groups sued the Navy, saying the same thing, that low frequency acoustic sonar uh, was harming marine mammals and that it uh, was a violation of US law for the US Navy to engage in those types of activities. Um, they won, they, the NGOs won at the, di at the uh, district court, they won at the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. The case was then taken to the Supreme Court by the Navy, and the Supreme Court overturned the, the, the lower court's decision saying that the Navy's interest in training realistically outweighed the interest of the environmental groups in, in protecting the marine mammals, if in fact low frequency acoustic sonar did harm marine mammals. There was no finding that that was actually the case, but whatever uh, the decision of the court, the Chinese looked at that and they said, well, that might be a good, a good argument for us to make uh, against the United States, uh, saying that their uh, intelligence ships are now harming our, uh, our resources. Platforms, for har harassment purposes, had changed completely to their civilian law enforcement uh, vessels. You don't see, you didn't see PLA vessels engaging in any type of harassment during this, uh, during this time period. It was all being done by China Maritime, uh, uh, um, the uh, State Ocean, Act, Ocean, Act, Ocean Act Administration and the Fisheries Law Enforcement Command, as well as their Customs Bureau. Again, these arguments didn't carry a whole lot of weight, so in 2013, we thought, well, maybe, maybe the Chinese have finally seen the light because at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, in 2003, the, one of the Chinese officers there publicly stated that the Chinese had been engaging in military activities in the US EEZ off of Guam and off of Hawaii without seeking the consent of the United States. So we figured, well, maybe they've come around. They're trying to develop a blue water navy. Uh, they, they see the value of being able to engage in military activities in other nations' EEZs. So maybe, maybe they've seen the light. But then we have the impeccable Nikau Pens incident a couple months later. Um, so have they changed their legal position? I, I don't think so. I still think that uh, they want to be able to engage in military activities in our EEZ um, because we won't object to that. But at the same time, they don't want us for all of these reasons, uh, to engage in those types of activities in their exclusive economic zone. Okay, let's switch gears now a little bit, talk about uh, some of the uh, territorial disputes. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. I'm gonna focus primarily on the South China Sea, territorial disputes with the Paracels and the, uh, and the Spratly Islands, because those are the ones that are uh, in the news more, more often. I'll also talk about the Senkaku uh, Islands, which is a dispute between China and Japan. Uh, when I talk about uh, the recently declared uh, air defense identification zone in the uh, East China Sea. 
Okay, so you look at the South China Sea. Um, the islands in the South China are claimed in their entirety by China, by Taiwan, and by Vietnam. Portions are claimed by Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, uh, and then Brunei uh, claims a, uh, a fishing um, zone in the, in the South China Sea. These very uh, proficient uh, or pr prolific uh, fishing grounds. Uh, they're used extensively by, uh, by the regional nations uh, for, their, for sources of protein. There's also potential oil and gas uh, off the coasts of, uh, of all of these nations. And strategic sea, sea, uh, sea lines of communication. A third of world's shipping goes through the South China Sea every year. 25% of the world's oil goes through the South China Sea every year. So the uh, very strategic sea lines of communication from, from a uh, uh, world economy uh, standpoint. So you can see here the various claimants. China basically draws a, uh, this is an, a, it's a nine dash line, we'll talk about that later, but everything that's within the cow's tongue, it's called the cow's tongue, all of the, the land features within the cow's tongue, China claims as sovereign Chinese territory. Um, you can see Vietnam also has a, claims virtually all of the South China Sea Islands. Um, the Philippines, a portion, not all, but a portion. Um, Malaysia, a small portion, then as I mentioned, uh, Brunei. It's really all about oil and gas. Uh, you can see there's already a significant amount of oil and gas development uh, off the coast of uh, Malaysia and Brunei. Some uh, not so extensive off the Philippines, some off of uh, Vietnam, but potential for significant oil and gas um, in these areas. Uh, so, um, for the Philippines, Reed Bank, uh, very uh, proven reserves that could be uh, instrumental to developing their economy. Um, it's about 130 some miles off the coast of, uh, of the Philippines. These are the features that are physically occupied by the various countries. You can see Vietnam occupies the most of them. Vietnam being uh, the black squares. Taiwan only has one island occupied. It's uh, been occupied by Taiwan since 1946. Uh, they were sent there as part of the uh, Allied forces to disarm the Japanese forces that were um, stationed on uh, Ituabu Island. Um, and uh, they never left, even though in March of 1946, pursuant to an agreement with the French, all the Allied forces were supposed to leave occupied territory so that the French could come back into China and, and reestablish their control over, over French Indochina. Ituabu, by the way, is really is the only island that has a fresh water source. None of the other uh, features in the, uh, in the uh, South China Sea have, uh, have fresh water source, which is significant when you start talking about what maritime zones these features are going to be entitled to, regardless of who has sovereignty. What, what's the, what, what type of maritime zones can they claim? If you're an island, you get the same maritime zones that a coastal state does. So you can get a 200 mile exclusive economic zone if you have an island. If you're you know, a uh, submerged reef, you get nothing. You don't get a maritime zone. And if you're a rock, which is a feature that's above water, but can't sustain human habitation, you only get a 12 mile territorial sea. So depending on how these features are classified will depend on the maritime zone that they're entitled to. And that's, that, that could be significant in trying to resolve uh, the ongoing dispute. But you can see Vietnam occupies the most, followed by the Philippines and then China and Malaysia um, um, also occupy a number of the features. Okay, talk about the cow's tongue. This has been in existence uh, since 1948. It was put out first by the uh, Republic of China, by the, by the Taiwanese, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, uh, folks. Uh, it originally was a, an 11 dash line. There was two additional lines that were over here in the uh, Gulf of Tonkin, but uh, there was a, once the, uh, the China and uh, North Vietnam entered into a uh, bilateral agreement that, uh, um, that resolved the uh, boundary in the Gulf of Tonkin, the uh, two lines up here went away, but they still have this nine, uh, nine dash line uh, and their argument is basically that they have all the islands, all the land features are sovereign territory. Then they have each of those features can claim 
at least at 12 nautical mile territorial sea, if not at 200 mile exclusive economic zone, and then all the rest of the waters that are encompassed within the cow's tongue, they have exclusive sovereign resource rights. So basically they're treating it like an exclusive economic zone for purposes of resource rights. But you can see it's been pretty consistent since 48, um, all the way up until uh, 2013 when they uh, uh, published new, uh, new official state maps of, uh, of China. Now, under international law, the fact that you discover a land feature doesn't mean that it's your sovereign territory. That used to be the rule. So, you know, when the Spanish came to the New World, they claimed the, uh, you know, what, Cuba or whatever for, for, for the uh, Kingdom of, uh, of Spain. That was okay back then, but under inter contemporary international law, if you discover a land feature, then you still have to effectively occupy that territory before it can become your sovereign territory. Uh, and that's shown by two things, public and permanent intent to occupy as well as a peaceful and continuous occupation uh, of, the, uh, of the feature. Now, I've just completed a very extensive research project on Chinese uh, claims in the South China Sea vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam's claims. And uh, my conclusion is that China has absolutely no claim whatsoever to any of the South China Sea Islands. Um, so, what is China trying to do? Well, they're trying to show that, yeah, but we're, we, we have effective occupation of, this, of these areas, therefore, and they're under our administrative control, so under international law, these features are ours. They're, they don't belong to, uh, to any other country. So what are they doing to demonstrate this effective occupation? Well, you'll recall in 74, as the U.S. was withdrawing from South Vietnam during the, uh, during the war, uh, China took advantage of, uh, of uh, our preoccupation with our withdrawal and invaded the, uh, the, Paracel, the, the, the Paracel Islands, the crescent group of the islands, which was occupied by South Vietnamese forces and expelled the, uh, the South Vietnamese garrison uh, from the islands. Clearly a violation of Article 2.4 of the Charter um, for violating the territorial integrity of, of another nation. Uh, at this time, uh, South Vietnam had inherited French claims, because France, in my research, France was the last country to really have clear title to the South China Sea Islands. So when the Japanese invaded in World War II, at the conclusion of the war, 1951 peace treaty, Japan renounces its rights to the Paracels and to the Spratly Islands, they revert back to France, their original owner. Then South Vietnamese inherits those, as the success, as successor state to France, when France leaves Indochina in the 1950s as a result of the, of the uh, um, French-Indochina uh, War. Then when the North and the South, Vietnam, unite, now the Socialist Republic of Vietnam acquires South Vietnam, Vietnam's interest in, this, in the South China Sea Islands. So Vietnam, in my mind, clearly has legitimate title to, uh, to both the Paracels and to the Spratlys. Fast forward 14 years later, um, what's happening in 1988? The Soviet Union's imploding. Uh, they are uh, North Vietnam's ally. So once again, China takes advantage of the preoccupation of the, uh, of the Russian government, the Soviet government, invades uh, Johnson South Reef, um, sinks a number of uh, North Vietnamese vessels, kills about 70 uh, North Vietnamese uh, uh, sailors, and then occupies uh, six uh, uh, features in the, uh, in the Spratly uh, archipelago. Again, fast forward a few more years. What's happening in uh, 1995? U.S. has withdrawn from the Philippines um, in the early 90s. So what does China do? They take advantage of this. They know that the U.S. isn't going to intervene, and they occupy Mischief Reef, which is um, off the coast of, uh, of the Philippines. And then in 2012, um, we had another incident involving the Philippines where um, two uh, China maritime surveillance ships prevented a uh, Philippine warship from arresting uh, illegal Chinese fishermen that were uh, fishing in Scarborough Shoal. You can see it here. Um, it's about uh, well within the 200 nautical mile uh, exclusive economic zone of, uh, uh, of the Philippines. Uh, and 
a great distance from, uh, from Hanan Island, uh, which is the nearest territory uh, that China has clear uh, jurisdiction over. And most recently, we saw, again, that uh, they've, they pretty much have, have taken control of Scarborough Shore and, and are preventing Ch Philippine fishermen from, uh, from operating in the, uh, in the area. Some of the other things that China's been doing, uh, every year they impose a fishing ban uh, south of the Paracels. Probably arrest about 400 Vietnamese fishermen every year. Hold them for a year, for, uh, fine them, uh, confiscate their boats. Uh, and, uh, and their catch. Uh, anytime any of the other nations uh, make any type of a claim to the South China Sea uh, area, there will be pr diplomatic protests filed by the uh, Chinese government. They've uh, increased their presence, uh, whether that be civilian law enforcement or uh, naval exercises or sending uh, fishing fleets to the area for, uh, for, to for have an increased presence. They've enacted some domestic laws. They've established a prefecture level city uh, in, uh, in 2012 that uh, is now responsible for administration of both the Paracels and the, uh, and the Spratly Islands, stood up a military garrison there, and have authorized the maritime police uh, that operate from Hanan Island to, uh, uh, to board foreign vessels that are in the South China Sea that are, that are illegally fishing. And then most recently they've uh, issued some new fishing regulations that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Other ways that they're trying to demonstrate that they exercise effective control and that, these, that, and that the resources within the region are, that belong to the Chinese government uh, is through uh, harassment of uh, resource rights of the uh, other coastal nations. Here you see Reed Bank uh, in 2011. We had a, a seismic survey ship that was conducting a, a survey of the Reed Bank uh, um, area for oil and gas because there has been uh, there are significant uh, proven reserves of oil and gas in the area. You can see it's 85 nautical miles off the coast of Palawan, clearly within the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Uh, and uh, the vessel was ordered out of the area by, by Chinese uh, uh, vessels. May of uh, 2011, again, 116 miles off the coast of Vietnam, within the 200 mile exclusive economic zone of, of Vietnam. Uh, you had a seismic survey ship, uh, the, the Bing Min 2, that had its, uh, its cable cut by Chinese vessels uh, while it was conducting a survey. Same thing in, uh, to, in June, uh, Viking 2, also a, uh, a, a, a Vietnamese vessel, uh, 60 miles off the coast, uh, ha was harassed by Chinese uh, um, civilian law enforcement. And then in November of uh, last year, another incident with the Bing Min uh, about 45 nautical miles off the coast uh, where China is interfering with, uh, with their resource rights. China has also indicated that uh, it is going to uh, lease a number of oil blocks and enter into joint development projects with, uh, uh, with foreign uh, oil companies. The problem is that all nine of the blocks are within the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. Uh, who has jurisdiction over the resources in that area. It's clearly not the Chinese, it's the Vietnamese. Now, the only country that really has uh, stood up to uh, the Chinese is the Philippines. They initiated an uh, arbitral proceeding against China in uh, January of uh, last year under the compulsory dispute settlement provisions of the convention. Uh, they're both parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, so there is a process by which parties of the convention can file um, for compulsory dispute settlement and the relief being sought by the Philippines is a declaration from the tribunal saying that, hey, everybody should get their maritime zones that, that, that are authorized under the Law of the Sea Convention, their territorial seas and their exclusive economic zones and their continental shelves. Continental shelf can go out to 200 miles as well, or in certain uh, cases even further if they meet certain uh, scientific criteria. They want a declaration by the tribunal that the Nang Dash Line is illegal. They want a determination on the status of the features. And remember I mentioned if you're an island, you get all the zones. If you're a rock, you only get a territorial Z to see. And if you're a low tide elevation, you get nothing. Uh, so they want a determination as to what the status of all the features are so that uh, you can start drawing, putting, drawing a map that shows where the potential overlap claims might be. And then they also want a declaration that they have a right to exercise their resource rights in their exclusive economic zone as well as the continental shelf. China has refused to participate in the proceedings. Uh, they, uh, 
the uh, oral hearings will probably occur within the next few months. The problem with the, dis with the dispute settlement provisions of the convention are that there really is no enforcement mechanism. So even if the Philippines prevails before the tribunal and the tribunal says, yeah, you're right, everything that China's doing is illegal, as long as China hasn't participated in the proceedings, there is no enforcement mechanism that the Philippines can rely on other than public opinion, uh, world opinion, to try to convince China to comply with the, uh, with the, with the order of the tribunal. How did China respond? You know, like I said, they didn't participate. What they did do was they've combined all of their civilian law enforcement um, bureaus into one China Maritime Police Bureau that's restructured under the State Ocean Af uh, Oceanic Administration. You can see there's five different law enforcement um, agencies that engage in maritime law enforcement for China. What does this mean? It, it means that now they've got really increased capacity to be able to have greater patrols as well as have increased manning vessels, aircraft, etc. What's the U.S. been doing um, since 2011 to 2011? Well, well the, uh, we've been negotiating this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is a uh, really kind of like an economic type of an agreement, uh, China specifically being excluded from those uh, negotiations. For the first time, a president of the United States attended the East Asia Summit. Uh, that had never occurred before. Uh, at the uh, 2012 Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense announced our rebalance to the Pacific, or, um, where the uh, Navy, naval forces will be, approximately 60% of our naval forces will be stationed in the Pacific. In 2011, we also entered into an, a, new, a new defense cooperation agreement with uh, uh, Australia, which allows for the rotational de deployment of up to 2,500 Marines. In, uh, in the Darwin area of, uh, of, of Australia. Uh, in addition, it gives us greater access to their airfields as well as uh, some of their uh, uh, ports um, on the north and on the western side of, uh, of, of Australia. Very important agreement with New Zealand in 2013. We've had strained relationships with New Zealand for many years because of their nuclear stance. Um, but this is a significant uh, uh, arrangement uh, for the first time. SECDEF now on a case-by-case -case basis can authorize a New Zealand warship to enter a U.S. Navy port. Up until 2013, they couldn't do that. So when a New Zealanders came to participate in RIMPAC, for example, in Hawaii, they'd have to tie up the pier down with the, uh, uh, where the cruise ships were. They weren't allowed to tie, in, tie up at, uh, in, in Pearl Harbor with the rest of the na naval ships that were participating in the exercise. So very significant uh, agreement. Uh, we've also gotten uh, increased access um, with, uh, in, with Vietnam, uh, as well as uh, increased ex military exercises with the Vietnamese, as well as with the Philippines, uh, same thing. Uh, a lot more ships and aircraft going into uh, Subic and into Clark, where our old bases used to be. Um, we're also looking at doing a rotational deployment of, uh, of Marines through, uh, through the Philippines, like we've done in Australia. Uh, the agreement is very close to being completed. I read something uh, that probably by, by Mar end of March or early April, the, uh, the, the new access agreement should be signed between the U.S. And, uh, and the Philippines. One other thing, uh, for the first time, we see a U.S. official. This isn't an official U.S. government position because it's not something that we've communicated directly to the Chinese government. But for the first time, we see a U.S. official criticizing the nine dash line, calling it into question with the, the legal validity of the nine dash line. So you got the Assistant Secretary of State Russell as well as the ambassador in the Philippines saying that uh, hey, this nine dash line doesn't pass the, uh, the straight face test when it comes to legal val val validity. So that's, a, that's a significant uh, step uh, because up to now we've kind of taken a, a position of neutrality with regards to the nine dash line. So this is a, this is a good thing. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, some of the other incidents that have occurred. Uh, under international law, all nations can declare an air defense identification zone to include international airspace. They can use unilaterally. There is no organization that governs how or when you can declare an air defense identification zone. And it's done so because to establish conditions of entry into your national airspace. So what it requires is if you're going to enter U.S. national airspace, for example, you've got to provide advance notification to, uh, to the U.S. government that you're going to do that. If you're not, if you're just going to transit through the air defense identification zone and have no intentions of entering the uh, U.S. Uh, 
national airspace, so you know, within 12 miles, then there's no requirement for you to comply with the ADIS procedures. As I mentioned, uh, we were the first nation with, with Canada to declare air defense identification zone uh, uh, around North America uh, in the uh, early 1950s. Um, we also have one around Alaska, have one uh, around Hawaii, and we have one around the Marshall Islands. So nothing uh, novel about this uh, for us, for the United States, to have a nation declare an air defense identification zone. Uh, under our ADIS procedures, if, as I mentioned, if you're going to enter U.S. national airspace, then you've got to provide identification. And what that requires is you've got to file a flight plan. You've got to have an operating two-way radio so you can communicate with, uh, um, with air tra traffic controllers. And you have to have an operable uh, radar beacon transponder to indicating who you are. Uh, but again, these procedures only apply to aircraft that have an intention of entering U.S. national airspace. So what's China done? In November of uh, 2013, they declared a fairly extensive uh, air defense identification zone in the uh, East China Sea to include the disputed Senkaku Islands with Japan. The object stated objective of the, uh, of the air defense identification zone was to defend their national territory or their na sovereignty and territorial air security, et cetera. All aircraft entering the zone have to comply and if you don't comply, then they have these unspecified defensive measures would be taken against uh, uh, aircraft that uh, did not comply with the ADIS procedures. Now, as I mentioned, um, we didn't have a problem with them declaring an ADIS because we've got our own ADIS, so it'd be kind of disingenuous for us to say, well, the U.S. can have an ADIS, but China can't. Uh, you can't make that kind of an argument. The problem is that It applies to all aircraft, whether they intend to enter national airspace or not. So if you're flying out here, if you're going from North, South Korea uh, and you're flying to the Philippines and you, and you cross the outer edge of the air defense identification zone, China requires you to provide notice that you're going to do that and comply with their ADIS procedures. Um, so that's a problem. Um, the additional problem is that it overlaps pre-existing air defense identification zones in the region. Both South Korea and Japan have had air defense identification zones that the U.S. declared back in the early 50s after the war. Um, and then in the 1960s, the, uh, the South Koreans and the uh, Japanese assumed control of these air defense identification zones. But they've been around for a long time. So what does China do? They've, without consulting with these other nations, they just went ahead and established their own ADIS to overlap the, uh, the pre-existing zones of these other nations. Again, an effort to in my mind, it's aimed directly at the Senkaku Island dispute um, to try to change the status quo. Again, a, a demonstration on their part that they effectively have administrative control of the Senkaku Island. And one of the ways they're doing that is by establishing this air defense identification zone. As you can imagine, the uh, Japanese weren't happy. Uh, they basically said that uh, this unduly uh, infringes freedom of flight in international airspace. Remember I told you over the high seas, nobody has the right to regulate the water or the airspace above the high seas, uh, that's international airspace. Um, because it requires all aircraft to comply, whether they have an intent to enter China, China's national airspace or not, um, the Japanese are there saying that, that that therefore infringes on freedom of overflight, not valid. and. To them, uh, as I mentioned, it's a clear uh, effort on their part to change the status quo of the uh, Senkaku Island dispute. South Korea uh, responded a little differently. Uh, as you recall, their defense uh, identification zone used to be right here. Uh, well, they've extended it now south into the Chinese air defense identification zone to include uh, Suyan Rock or Iodo Reef, which is a, a dispute between China and South Korea as to who owns this submerged rock. It's a rock that's four feet below sea level, and both of them are claiming sovereignty over it, saying that it's their sovereign territory. So pretty ridiculous uh, argument on both their sides, but still, um, that was the response from South Korea uh, to uh, um, extend their air defense identification zone to encompass the disputed area in response to the Chinese uh, efforts to do the same. Uh, U.S., uh, our State Department, issued uh, 
some concerns, it increases tensions in the region. Um, we don't support efforts to apply these procedures to aircraft that are not intending to enter national airspace. And we have defense commitments to our allies, i.e. Uh, South Korea and to Japan in this area. Uh, DOD statement, very, you know, very similar. Destabilizing attempt to change the status quo. Um, it's not going to change how we conduct our military operations in the area. And we reaffirm our defense obligations under our treaty with Japan because we specifically apply the Mutual Defense Treaty to the Senkaku Islands because they are islands that are under the administration of Japan. After World War II, the Senkakus and the other Ryukyu Islands, including Okinawa, were placed under U.S. administration. Uh, in 1972, we turned administrative control of the Ryukus and the Senkaku Islands back to the government of Japan. Uh, so as a result, they are territory that fall within the scope of our defense obligations under our mutual defense treaty with, uh, with Japan. Just some other reactions from uh, some other countries, both within the region and, and out of the region. Uh, you'll, you'll have access to this uh, later. We also conducted a freedom of navigation assertion shortly after the ADIS was announced by sending two B-52 uh, B bombers from Guam to go enter the uh, southern end of the, uh, of the uh, air defense identification zone uh, without providing notice uh, to, the, uh, to the Chinese government. Japan and uh, the Koreans did the same. Uh, uh, the uh, Koreans in, uh, in the vicinity of uh, Iodo Rock uh, conducted uh, a uh, fawn challenge, as did the uh, Japanese in the vicinity of the Senkakus down here, and then they did a joint search and rescue exercise uh, as well uh, in the air defense identification zone without notifying the, uh, the uh, Chinese. Um, and another exercise by the, uh, by the Koreans. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the U.S. said, well, this isn't valid because it applies to all aircraft that are going to transit through the, through the ADIS, whether they have intent to enter the, uh, the uh, national airspace of China or not. But then we did something somewhat strange. We had the uh, FAA issued a notice to airmen saying that all civilian carriers, so United, Delta, et cetera, you will comply with China's new ADIS requirements. So on the one hand, we're saying that it's invalid and we don't want, we're not going to comply. And on the other hand, we're telling our civilian aircraft to, uh, to comply. The stated purpose being for safety of navigation, which I think is somewhat ridiculous because I don't think China is stupid enough to shoot down a civilian aircraft that's flying you know, a couple hundred miles off their coast. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Japan and the Korea, on the other hand, um, told their aircraft, their civilian aircraft, not to comply. They don't view this as a valid air defense identification zone. The requirements are invalid. Therefore, they're, they're telling their aircraft, do not comply. But other countries have joined the, uh, the U.S. side, indicating that their aircraft will comply with the, uh, with the ADIS requirements. Last uh, issue that we'll look at is on the 14th of January of this year, China issued new fisheries regulations that basically says any Buddy that wants to fish in the South China Sea has to have the permission of the Chinese government to do so. Uh, if you uh, don't have the permission of the Chinese government, you, we will seize your catch and you will be fined $82,000 uh, for non-compliance. Uh, we're, we're not uh, receiving the permission of, uh, of China to fish in the South China Sea. Again, our response is provocative, uh, no basis under international law. Philippines, they're obviously upset. This is uh, uh, they rely uh, heavily on their fishermen rely heavily on uh, on the South China Sea for their uh, for their livelihood. Uh, escalates tensions, threat to peace and security. Uh, contrary to the 2002 Declaration of Conduct, which is something that China has signed, it's a non-binding agreement, but still requires the the, uh, uh, the parties, the ASEAN and China not to do things to uh, increase tensions uh, in the South China Sea as they're trying to resolve the underlying territorial disputes in the, uh, in the uh, area. Vietnam also, uh, illegal uh, requirement on the part of China. And here's China's response. This is just a technical revision to our old laws. Uh, we've, this has been uh, in existence for a long time. 
um, and this uh, this is a, in practice with uh, um, or in line with uh, with international practice uh, in order to preserve the fish stocks in the uh, in the South China Sea. So just to sum up, when we look at uh, China's uh, uh, claims, remember I listed all those excessive claims on that one page. China has excessive claims in all of those areas, um, whether it be straight, illegal straight baselines, um, historic bait claims, EEZ, you name it, uh, they, uh, they, they have a, uh, an excessive claim for every one of those. We have protested all of those, either diplomatically or through a uh, freedom of navigation assertion uh, with uh, ships or aircraft. Uh, South China Sea Islands, our position is we do not take a position on the underlying sovereignty dispute to the to the uh, islands in the South China Sea, whether it's the Paracels or the Spratleys. However, we do have a national interest in freedom of navigation and access to the South China Sea because it is a strategic sea lines of communication and it's an area where we exercise uh, routinely uh, and uh, we support what the Philippines is doing, which is multilateral dispute settlement um, and as well as a binding ASEAN code of conduct as opposed to just a non-binding declaration of conduct uh, and we expect that uh, all maritime claims will be settled in accordance with international law and that the, the uh, one side won't use threat or coercion to try to intimidate the other parties to, uh, to uh, settle the dispute. With regards to our defense obligations uh, to the Philippines and the South China Sea, uh, we have told the Philippines that the Mutual Defense Treaty does not apply to the land territory that they claim in the South China Sea because we don't take a position on the underlying validity of those claims. However, the treaty does provide that, or does apply to any attack on Philippine forces in the Pacific. So right now we've got about a half dozen uh, or, or, or a dozen uh, Philippine Marines that are living on a, uh, on a uh, hull of a ship that they beached in uh, Two Thomas Shoal and the Chinese have prevented their resupply uh, by uh, um, by civilian ships, they did drop them some, some supplies by air, uh, but what happens if the Chinese use force against those Marines on, on Two Thomas Shoal? Does, does our defense obligations under the treaty apply? Uh, and I would argue that it does, because it's an attack on Philippine forces in the Pacific. Same thing with the Senkakus. We do not take a, a, a position on the underlying territorial dispute. However, I will say I've just started a new research project to determine China's claim versus Japan's claim versus the Senkaku Islands. And one thing that I found in my initial research is that our position used to be that the Jap Japanese did exercise sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands because if they didn't, there was no reason for them to be placed under U.S. administration after the war. They would have just been given back to China, like Taiwan and the Pescadores were given back to China, and Manchuria was given back to China. Uh, so our initial position back uh, during the negotiations of the 1951 peace treaty was that they had residual sovereignty in the, uh, in the Senkakus and they were just being placed under U.S. administration. However, that changed in uh, the 70s. Uh, we got some pressure from Taiwan. Uh, they, they were in the process of losing their seat at the UN. Uh, there was also some, uh, we, we were engaged in some trade negotiations with Taiwan, and as a result of that, we changed our position to basically say we don't take a position now on the underlying sovereignty claims to the uh, Citizen Cock Island. However, uh, we have said very specifically that our mutual defense obligations under the treaty do apply because the treaty is written uh, to say that it applies to all territory that is administered by Japan. Not that it's Japanese territory, as long as it's administered by Japan, then the treaty applies. So uh, we've been very emphatic um, to state that our mutual defense obligations apply uh, in, the, uh, in the Senkakus uh, were China to uh, take some type of measure or use of force against the uh, Japanese uh, in, uh, in the Senkakus. Questions?